The following is an AZPM original production. For AZPM, I'm Mark McLemore, and this is Arizona Spotlight. Coming up. For an evening of thrills and suspense, the Arizona Theater Company is asking you to dial in for murder. Bisbee Bikeways is a grassroots plan to make the legendary mining town safer and more accessible. Find out what Megan Connolly and many others are hoping to see. And learn the secrets of the Vegan Night Market, a quarterly community building event for those exploring a meatless and dairy free lifestyle. Those stories are all next on Arizona Spotlight. One of Alfred Hitchcock's most successful thrillers was Dial M for Murder. It was adapted from a 1952 play by Frederick Knott and was first produced for BBC television. In the decades following, it was so overshadowed by the film version that it was only rarely performed on stage. The Arizona Theatre Company is presenting Dial M for Murder starting this weekend. In addition to eye-catching design and costumes that celebrate London of the 1950s, this adaptation features a twist. The troubled marriage of socialite Margot Wendis that leads to a deadly betrayal revolves around a same-sex affair, as Margot finds love with a progressive-minded writer named Maxine Hadley. Joining me now to talk about the production are the two leading performers, Awesta Zarif and Lucy Lavely. Awesta will begin. This adaptation, it's kept all the charm and suspense and noir of that original Dial M script. But in this version, my character, Margot, has so much more autonomy. And um, if you remember Grace Kelly in the film, I love Grace Kelly, a complete icon, but she's sort of written to be a little bit almost lobotomized, like things keep happening to her and she's so powerless, you know, and, um, you know, people come in and and figure things out for her and save her. In this version, it's very different. Uh, Margot does take action, does try to make some bold choices for herself to get herself out of this mess that's happened. And that's been the most fun. At the start of the play, you kind of think, oh, this is going to be one of those archetypal characters, damsel in distress, and soon you'll see that that is not the case. And Lucy, what about playing Maxine, who in previous versions of the play is sometimes known as Max or maybe even Mark? Tell me about approaching the role of a woman in that position in the 1950s. First of all, I think storytelling, one of the most valuable and powerful tools is to look back to the past and we learn so much about where we come from and what's occurred in our history as a result. Um, There were many women like Maxine Hadley living fully functioning and beautiful lives in the 50s. Unfortunately at the time it wasn't at the forefront of culture uh, to be accepted as your full self in every spectrum, right, in in the broad spectrum of humanity. And so this story is really important because every human who walks the earth today has benefited from the steps that Margot and Maxine have trod. And our society has developed in a way that we can reflect on humanity and let everyone be okay. We've come a long way from the 50s. You know, they say uh, those who don't read history are condemned to repeat it, etc. And I do think that tale is as old as time when it comes to theater. Everything that Maxine and Margot do has paved way to the society that we are fighting to live in today. And I think there will be a lot of audience members who had women in their lives, in their families, who had gone unseen. And we are resurrecting the spirits of women who have gone unseen for a very, very long time for no other reason than what they do privately in their bedroom. Awesta, you shared with us that you are now living in New York. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to you to come out here to Tucson? Originally from San Diego, you told me. So it's not that different in terms of climate, perhaps. Right. But um, to come here and work with ATC, what kind of an experience is that for you? It's kind of funny. They say move like as an actor, you move to New York City so that you can 
leave and get jobs in other places. Um, and it's always a treat for me to be sort of on this side of the country. And, um, you know, I was saying that the the vibes here in Tucson and Arizona are very similar to what I grew up around in San Diego. Um, I was born in Afghanistan, but grew up in San Diego, California. So that's sort of what I consider hometown. And I, yeah, I think just the general atmosphere, there's um, a friendliness on the side of the country. There's an openness and it's always positive to be around that. Not to spoil any of the uh, important action in the play, but there's some physicality involved mm, in your role. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I wonder what that's like for you. Have you done roles where you've had to uh, engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with people before? Yes, absolutely. And I love it. I love physical theater. Uh, the thing is, we couldn't be more safe. So it's me and my scene partner, but we also have a fight director. We have the stage manager watching over us. We have a fight captain that we elect whose sole responsibility is to come to our fight call, make sure we're doing everything safely and give us the green light. Yeah, it's totally fun because you know, yes, of course, if sometimes in show speed, you can lose yourself. But if you, you know, remember your training and remember to stay cool and that it's a choreographed dance piece almost, then, you know, everything should be fine. And I live for those moments. I love it. In certain types of stage plays, you've got comedy where you get immediate feedback from the audience. Mm -hmm. But this being a thriller means you must create suspense. You mm -hmm. need to keep the audience on the edge of their seat. How does that feel as a performer, though? When is it that you feel successful at doing that? Well, we had our first preview last night. And being able to audibly hear the audience's reactions to some of those suspenseful moments is so gratifying. And it doesn't always happen. You know, some audiences are quiet and or react in different ways. There's a lot of mystery. There, there are moments in this play where maybe one person on stage knows something that's going on and the other person doesn't. And so if something's happening behind me and the audience reacts to that, you know, obviously I can't be aware of that. Um, so it's just so fun. And you do your best to, to stay in the moment and sort of zone it out. But it's good to know that the audience is following along. And those sometimes those vocal reactions remind us as actors that, OK, we are telling a clear story here. But yeah, my job is to not react at all, right, is, is to not even acknowledge that so that I can keep that suspenseful feeling. And Lucy, what are your observations about performing a suspenseful play as opposed to other types of theater? Oh, it's wonderful to experience the final part of our play, which is the audience. We spend a lot of time preparing and to meet and greet the audience, um, which is the essence of being an actor, right? That's where we get the phrase, you know, being on the boards, right? An actor is not performing until someone is watching. And it was terribly thrilling to experience them experiencing us and this story that we had crafted meeting its final piece, the cherry on top. It was exciting. And um, it's wonderful as performers because when we get that cherry on top, we've got another layer of work yeah. to do, which is how do we clearly tell the story? How do we lift those moments? It's, you know, humans vocalize, right? Speech is breath plus impulse. So any sound that comes out shouldn't be judged, right? It's it's a human experiencing something. And in thrillers, it often will come out in a giggly, uh, excited, suspenseful type of way. And it's it's wonderful to experience humanity like that th through the fourth wall. And exactly what Oesta said, this isn't a piece where we are speaking to them or responding to them. So we're doing our work on the other side to suspend through the moment so that they can have the catharsis, that that quick release, but then stay in the story with us. And that's a little homework for us. It's, it's so thrilling to step on your own laughs. Mm -hmm. It's so thrilling to <laughs> to plow through a moment that, that you don't think the audience <clears throat> might experience through a, a voice impulse. Uh, and of course, as actors, we don't wanna plow through our own laughs, mostly so they can hear what we're saying next. But it's it's the natural first experience of when that cherry comes. You said that you have already done your first preview, so that means you have been in your costume. And I mm. wonder how much of your character came in that costume to you? How much did you find Maxine through the clothing? What a wonderful question. And so relevant for me particularly. I work through this guise that what you are experiencing on stage is Lucy and not Lucy. 
you are experiencing Maxine and not Maxine, right? My job, unlike a lot of artists, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman has a great quote about musicians being able to distance themselves from their work, right? Painters being able to distance themselves from their work. I can't distance myself from my work. These are my vocal cords. This is my body. So for me particularly, I've always had a love of physical expression through clothing. And so for me, a part of my process is starting as early as I can with that. What's the silhouette that I'm working with? I, Lucy, am a very physicalized, um, physically active person. And the 50s was a different type of uh, female existence. And so for me, that has to come way, way early. And yet you can never prepare for how fabulous you feel in those costumes and that wig under the under the lights. And so a part of previews is really adjusting to that. Um, the silhouette of, of women, you know, it comes, of course, from the essence of subjugating the female body. But uh, we as women who identify as women, there's a delicious essence to the 50s, which is this body con formation, um, flattering what is inside of you and bringing it out through the fashion. Pretty much the same question for you, Oeste, because the character you play, Margot, she's wealthy, she's a yeah. socialite. You mentioned she was played in the film version by Grace Kelly, no yes. less. So what did it feel like to you the first time that you put on Margot's clothes? This is a very interesting question for our production in particular, I feel, because for me, what comes out in the physicalities of my character is is really completed once I have those period pieces on and I sort of it informs so much of how I move my body um, but without giving away you know too many details from our rehearsal process you know I was really encouraged to play against that in a lot of this play and so now the challenge becomes okay I have this gorgeous 1950s style gown where it's you know fitted perfectly to my body but how do I forget that completely and imagine I'm in my sweats you know sharing secrets with my best friend because Margo would have forgotten about it I mean to Margo that's absolutely that, that, those are her sweats exactly yeah in a way that that's true yeah and there are moments in this play where we play up the period and the genre as a reflection of the things for example my character might be hiding or trying to keep at bay from those around her. And there are moments where she allows herself to put her guard down and be raw. And perhaps those are the moments where you might find me, you know, cross-legged in a big taffeta gown, you know? Um, so that's really been a gift from our director, Michael Garces. He's like, you know, the clothes are not, in this case, here to inform you. You are here to inform the clothing and move as you would and ignore the structures around you. Don't play into those. So it's that's really been a different process for me. Well, you brought up the director, Michael Garces, yes. and let's say something about what he is imbuing this project with. Yes. I think that his top concern is the psyche of each individual character and not just why they make the choices they do, but why they react in the ways that they do. What are the relationships that we, our characters, are having with ourselves? Because each person in this play has their own prerogative, has their own goal and, you know, reasons for doing what they're doing. And what is that relationship that, and, you know, he's always watching and, you know, making sure that, um, you know, are you listening to what he just said? Are you reacting to that? Even though, you know, this is a scene between two other people, he wants to make sure that everyone is still has their internal monologue going on. And Lucy, if you were confiding in a colleague about your experience working on this play, <laughs> what, what might you say about the director, Michael Garces? Oh, it's, you know, Oesta said it perfectly and concisely and uh, quite literally a very similar experience. It's wonderful to work with a director who is concerned with your journey, right? We as actors, it's a very strange job. We are our own representatives. We are our own president. We are our own cabinet. We are our own uh, formation. And so... We are filling those moments constantly. So to have a director who can really have the bandwidth to make you feel valued, right? Everyone has an impulse to be heard and seen in good lighting through truth, right? And it's wonderful when you really feel that validation from the director. I recently saw a video where they asked some uh, children to call their parents and gave them a dial telephone. And this was completely new to these kids. And so at best, they would put their fingers in the holes one at a time and wonder why they didn't hear a beep. So Dial In For Murder, the very title of this play, is now dated. Yeah. Do either of you remember using a dial telephone when you were children? 
my grandmother had one in her home, but I don't know if it was actually functioning or a decorative piece. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure that I actually made calls on it, but I it was there, yes. Okay. <laughs> I did have a rotary phone in my home. Rotary phone, yes. And uh, I don't interact with the phone because I'm a guest in this gorgeous home. However, uh, during tech, I was able to sit down next to the phone, and I had such a visceral experience <laughs> dialing my own phone number on the rotary and mm -hmm. it was such an informative experience as a human and an actor i don't remember the last time since that rotary phone that i've been on set with a rotary phone mm -hmm. yeah. um it was it was delicious and it is dated and that's why it's fun you know people say theater is is really attractive to history buffs right it's sort of a live action essence of exploring history and this mm -hmm. is a beautiful examination of the 1950s through the tech through the team through the director through the the opportunity provided by this theater I am so grateful that you didn't update this play to yeah. be text M for murder. Oh, gosh. Oh, wow. Can you oh, imagine gosh. text emoji? Siri? Yeah, <laughs> Siri, text emoji M for murder. <laughs> Awesta Zarif and Lucy Lavely star in Arizona Theater Company's production of Dial M for Murder. It runs through October 12th at the Temple of Music and Art in Tucson before heading to the Tempe Center for the Arts from October 19th through November 3rd. We have a link for all the information on the Spotlight page at azpm.org. There's a growing movement around the world to install bicycle and pedestrian lanes in places where cars are the dominant mode of transportation. Among other benefits, supporters say these projects help reduce air pollution, improve people's health, and increase community equity for those who can't afford or don't want to own a car. In Bisbee, residents have embarked on one such grassroots effort, and so far they've raised millions of dollars towards their goal. Next, Tony Paniagua introduces us to a Bisbee native who has spent several years of her life working on Bisbee Bikeways, a nonprofit organization. Megan Connolly, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Let's begin with Bisbee Bikeways. What is this organization all about? So Bisbee Bikeways is a project of the 501c3 Ecotopia, um, and the mission of Ecotopia is to enhance the public health and sustainability of Cochise County. Um, so the goal of Bisbee Bikeways is to create a network of alternative transportation um, so that people can get around safely either on bike or by foot throughout the Bisbee area, including down to Naco, which is on the border of Mexico. And currently you are planning the first section, if you will, which goes from downtown historic Bisbee to the neighborhood or the part of the city that's called Lowell. Can you try to paint a picture for us, please? This is the first segment that we are going to have constructed out of this network of pathways. Um, so people will be able to leave Old Bisbee. They go under the underpass, um, and it's likely that there will be a box culvert that will have to be constructed, so a new tunnel under Highway State Route 80. And then people will be able to go along State Route 80 around the Lavender Pit, which is the big hole in the ground in the middle of Bisbee. Um, and they'll be able to do that safely because it'll be separated by concrete median and concrete barrier. Um, so we're going to take two travel lanes out and basically create a separated shared use path. And then they'll be able to exit in Lowell. Can you describe what it would be like right now if you wanted to walk or ride a bicycle around the Lavender Pit? If you start walking out of Old Bisbee, uh, you would be on the mountainside of the highway. Um, and there is actually a sidewalk there. So you follow that sidewalk, and then it just comes to an abrupt end in um, basically right next to the Lavender Pit Overlook. So then you would cross four lanes of traffic traveling anywhere from 35 to 60 miles an hour cross those four lanes of traffic and then get onto what can really only be called a wide curb. It's about 18 inches wide um, next to a fence that has barbed wire on the top of it. Occasionally, you know, cars will run into that fence. The barbed wire hangs down into that area. People will have to walk into the road. Um, and then if you're riding your bike, you basically just have to ride in the four lanes of traffic. So there's really no safe way to get around it. 
Is it a total of four lanes at the moment? Yes, currently there are two travel lanes in either direction, so four travel lanes total. What have people thought about your idea so far? A lot of people are really in favor of it. Um, a lot of people see that this is going to create a safer passage. Um, there is no safe way to basically get around from Old Bisbee to the rest of town on foot or on bike. And someone actually did get hit by a car, unfortunately, in 2021. So um, this is definitely a safety issue. And people also see it as enhancing their quality of life. Just being able to get from one part of town to the rest of town is going to be a huge benefit. Um, there are definitely some people who are opposed to reducing the lanes. And I think basically that is just stemming from not wanting to experience change um, and maybe you know, some feeling of like this being gentrification or something like that. But, you know, ultimately I'm doing this for the residents of Bisbee. And I was born in Bisbee. You mentioned that some people are perhaps not very happy about the possibility of losing two lanes. And this could be expected if that's what they're used to doing is driving back and forth between different places. But you also said that this is part of motor normativity. What is this all about? Motor normativity is a term that was created by a, an environmental psychologist. And if you just Google the term motor normativity, you'll come up with a study. Um, and basically what this person discovered in his study was that people are more willing to experience the negative consequences of being in a car centered world than, for instance, other public health things like he just basically sub substituted words um, in, in his survey to say, for instance, would you be willing in a crowded area to inhale smog from a car? And people were more than willing to do that. But then he substituted that, for instance, with would you be willing to inhale cigarette smoke in a crowded area? And people were less willing. And so it just kind of revealed how we've been indoctrinated to believe that we have to live in this the, this car-centered world that has these negative consequences, including climate change. Megan, in addition to trying to answer to some people who don't want to lose these lanes, there are also other difficulties or challenges in that you have various parties involved in this whole process. For example, uh, Bisbee Bike Wiz U, uh, the city of Bisbee, ADOT, and then the mining company, Freeport, McMoran. Can you explain how you are trying to juggle all these different organizations and what does that mean? Yeah, so it's been a, a huge um, bureaucratic <laughs> maze, if you will. Um, the area around the pit is owned by Freeport. Um, ADOT has the right-of-way, and it's within city limits. And so because it's a highway, the city says, well, that's ADOT's territory. We're not going to put a pathway there. And then ADOT says, well, we officially don't create bike and pedestrian lanes. So that's the city's responsibility. Um, and and then Freeport says, well, we're just a private, you know, mining company. That's ADOT's highway. So we're not taking responsibility for that. So basically nobody took responsibility for it and basically said, you have to raise the money on your own. So we've gone out and raised um, now just for the Lavender Pit Path um, eight and a half million just to get this done. And it's been um, be, the reason that we've managed to get that money is because we have so much community support. We have over 75 letters of support from local businesses, from state representatives, and um, we also have data from local businesses showing that this will create 292 jobs and 5.4 million in private investment because of the increase in tourist traffic. So because of this support, we have been able to get these funds, despite the fact that we are just a tiny grassroots organization. Are you surprised uh, close to $9 million raised by this grassroots movement? And, and is that enough? What happens next? How much money would you ultimately need if, in fact, you get the green light? So we have $8.5 million for the Lavender Pit, and that's for the final design and construction of just that piece of highway, which is only 1.43 or so miles. We actually have to raise another $207,000 uh, for a cash match, which we're in the midst of a fundraiser now. And people can go to our website at bisbeebikeways.com to donate. 
But then we also got another $641,000 grant for the feasibility study of the entire network of pathways, um, which will bring us that much closer to the final design and construction for the rest of the network. Really, it's just a matter of, you know, can I keep doing this volunteer work? And that's where the more people that we get to help us through donations, the more likely it will be that this network happens. You're dreaming of this network of up to 25 miles all the way to Mexico. Right, yeah. So it's it'll go all the way down to the border in Mexico, um, and we'll be able to go to Camp Naco, which is um, a project that uh, the city of Bisbee recently got $9 million for, which is down in Naco, right on the border, to create a new community center. And so we'll be able to ride our bikes and walk all the way from Old Bisbee down there. Um, and then into San Jose. So all the different neighborhoods of Bisbee will get connected. And then um, hopefully this will be connected to the bigger um, path, which is the Sun Corridor Trail, which is gonna go hopefully from Las Vegas, Nevada to Douglas, Arizona. So this will connect to that bigger trail as well. You also mentioned having two daughters and you were thinking about the future of not only Bisbee, but in a broader sense about our planet. Yeah, so um, the reason that I initially wanted to do this is uh, when my first daughter was born in 2017, I felt overwhelmed by the weight of climate change um, and how could I bring this beautiful being into a world that is on the brink of collapse by climate change. So I just try to do something on a local level about something as massive as climate change, so to create an alternative to driving. Um, And then that combined with just wanting to get kids out and away from screens in general, having a safer way to get to Old Bisbee, which is where I like to hang out. You know, there's a lot of music and restaurants, so it seemed to make sense. How realistic is it that this is all going to happen? What's your response to that? Well, I've been told since I started this that it was impossible to get this path around the Lavender Pit. People told me they tried for years to do this. Um, In fact, the first time I called the ADOT district engineer, Bill Harmon, really nice guy, um, he's since retired. Uh, He said he has been trying to do this for 22 years. So um, I've been told since day one that this is impossible, and we've already got over $9 million. So I just don't listen to the naysayers. You're also doing a fundraiser moving forward. What's that all about? So we have a fundraiser online happening, and if you go to our website, you'll see the fundraiser, bisbeebikeways.com. But we also have a concert, a festival concert, happening October 5th at Old Field Oasis, which is just outside of Bisbee. So that's on a Saturday, and it's from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. We're going to have 12 bands. We're going to have a bike rodeo for kids, face painting, a bike raffle, kids' helmet giveaway, pedal-powered smoothies and pedal-powered art, and a bouncy house. And we're asking people to um, bring picnics, too. So we hope to see people there. For more information about the online campaign, the benefit event, and the proposal itself, we have a link to the Bisbee Bikeways website and Facebook page on the Spotlight page at azpm.org. The rising interest in adopting different approaches to healthy eating is helping a local food event to grow over the last couple of years. The vegan night market is making it easier for people to expand their culinary options without consuming meat, milk, or other animal products. Next, Tony Paniagua has an interview with the night market's originator. Hannah Hernandez, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. How did vegan night market come about? Tucson Foodie was looking to throw some fun events for Tucson, and I wanted to show off the vegan food around here. We have a lot going on, a lot of exciting vegan options, and Tucson Foodie was was game to to make it happen. So we, we kind of collaborated and got a bunch of nice vendors together. 
So you decided to become a vegan in 2017. Can you tell us a little bit about that decision and how that has changed your life over the years? I went vegan for the animals. I saw a documentary and uh, it just kind of made me think a little more about where my food comes from and you know what we're consuming. And I kind of changed everything. And then what happened after that? Started clearing out the, the cupboards and the fridge. Started kind of rethinking and being more conscious of my purchases at the grocery store and where I was eating, uh, going out to eat. And then it just went from there. My husband joined me, so that made it a lot easier. And then you came up with a social media name, and that's and you called it Death Free Foodie, and that took off. Can you tell us about that, please? Yeah, I had a few different usernames to begin with, but Death Free Foodie one, my husband thought of it. It was a really good name. Kind of makes you think. It makes you think a little bit. What do you like about being a vegan and, and why do you recommend it to other people? We were speaking ahead of this interview. You don't want to be one of those pushy people like you need to do this, but you recommend it. Can you tell us about that, please? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that showing people how exciting the food is, how it makes you feel like I just feel good. Um, it's so easily accessible. And, you know, yelling the people, the vegans that are yelling and stuff, it might be good for some people, but I think the nice way to go about it is just to show off the nice things. Maybe say, hey, listen, you like to eat that, but let me introduce you to some options that perhaps you hadn't thought about in the past. Exactly. Yeah. Do you have these old favorites like green corn tamales or whatever your old favorite is growing up? You can get that still. You can get it vegan. It's easy and it tastes just the same. How long has it been around and how has that growth taken place over the years? The Unite Market began uh, 2023. June, uh, I believe it was June 3rd was our first one. And it's just, we expected people to trickle in. It really didn't think, you know, oh, this would be a nice little event. And then we had over a thousand people that first night. Everyone sold out. All the vendors sold out. So wild. Everyone just keeps growing. This last one had over 3,000 people. Did you ever imagine that you'd be getting these huge turnouts? Absolutely not. <laughs> no. It's so exciting. Like I really thought it would be a handful of people each time. I like, loved vegan food, but it's everyone. It's non-vegans. It's everyone that just loves food and in socializing. It's just a big party is what, what I like to think of it. And you mentioned that earlier in the uh, prior to this interview that uh, choosing a nighttime event was a deliberate action. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't like to go out during the day. Like I'm really pale. I burn easily. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's just a different vibe. Like I just wanted it to be something fun for people to do, vegan or not. Just like come out, look at the pretty lights, get some really good food that happens to all be vegan. It's nice for people to experience it. I was looking at the list of vendors there and you have dozens upon dozens of different options. Uh, what kind of uh, different types of foods might people be able to taste? There's so many like um, hot dogs, pizza, there's uh, all sushi, there's all the good stuff. Um, yeah, Hawaiian food. I don't know if you've heard of like loco moco is like a popular food in Hawaii. My dad always talks about they have we're gonna have a vegan version of that wild to me um, and just um Hot wings, everything you could think of. What might I want to try if I've never had much of a desire to eat vegan food? What were some of your recommendations? Mm -hmm. I definitely think fried sushi. Fried sushi is going to be so good. And um, the hot dogs are pretty amazing for anyone. Like we're going to have like a full vegan Sonoran dog and like chili dogs, burgers of all kinds. Like there's just going to be um, something for everyone vegan sushi how is that even possible especially when we're talking about sushi which is supposed to be raw fish some rolls can just be as simple as avocado and it's just a fried rice sushi roll with some avocado and cucumber in there maybe some jalapeno um they put drizzle eel sauce and it's amazing you know it's just a nice little veggie roll but um there are like mock fish like it's just protein it's like soy protein or whatever you know and then just drizzle it with vegan mayo, like spicy mayo and uh, eel sauce. Eel, in quote, it's not real eel sauce, you know. Uh, it's amazing, especially if they fry it. So we're talking hot dogs and burgers and we're saying no meat? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no meat at all. And a lot of them, too, are not using the mock meats because I'm not the biggest fan of all the mock meats, you know, and I try to keep my consumption low with those. So it's kind of nice to, that you know, there's going to be a lot of just really good ingredients and stuff used. People are really conscious of that, but making it taste good. You don't know you're eating healthy. 
the Tucson vegan scene, like it's it's wild. We have so many options and it's not something that takes a lot of effort. It's pretty great. Thank you so much, uh, Hannah Hernandez. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. The Vegan Night Market is located in the Heirloom Farmer's Market Pavilions at Rieto Park. The next gathering is this Saturday, September 28th, from 6 to 10 p.m. It will feature more than 50 vendors offering vegan food of all kinds, cocktails served in a 21 and over area, plus music, live tattooing, vegan-friendly arts and crafts, and more. We have a link on the Spotlight page at azpm.org. Thank you for listening to Arizona Spotlight. This show is a production of AZPM. The music is by Calexico. The production engineer is Jim Blackwood. Production assistance by Sophia Hammer. I'm producer and host, Mark McLemore. AZPM's original productions are made possible in part by the Community Service Grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by donations from listeners like you. Learn more at support.azpm.org. Thank you.